Welcome to another tutorial. Here we are going to look at some of the questions that you expect to prepare on as far as paper 2 is concerned. This is just a concept paper that enable you to prepare for your paper 2 exam uh, very well and I wish you the best for the, this coming exam so that um, you can be able to achieve your dreams. Um, before I start, if you are new to this channel, consider subscribing so that anytime I upload a video like this, you get notified. Now we need to start with the first question. You are told that the student measures the temperature of uh, the sum of water during heating. The sum of water has a mass of 0 0.45 kgs. Calculate the energy to increase the temperature of water from 16 degrees Celsius to 100 degrees Celsius. And when you are given a question like this, you must be provided with a specific heat capacity. And for this case, the specific heat capacity is 4,200 joules per kg per degree Celsius. Questions like this will not miss in paper 2. And you can be asked to work out the quantity of heat. You can be asked to work out the mass. You can be asked to work out the temperature or change in temperature. Then the most important formula that you ought to remember is this formula that we are going to mention here and of course change in heat equals to mass times specific specific heat capacity times temperature change and this change in temperature change in theta is usually the final temperature with 100 degrees celsius minus 16 uh, degrees celsius so our mass is given here specific capacity is given so we need to work out change in temperature and this our change in temperature in this case is uh, 84 degrees Celsius. So having uh, obtained that, we can now be able to go straight and put that in our calculator so that we can be able to get our answer and then we can be able to write it down here. Now moving to the next part, we are told that the diagram shows the temperature time graph for a sum of water and um, we are supposed to answer a few questions here. Use the graph to determine time taken from when the water started to boil to when the water uh, stopped boiling. So remember at boiling point, uh, at that given point when there is a change of state, there is no change in temperature. So where you have the flat graph, it means that's where boiling is taking place. So we are supposed to go straight and identify this point and this point so that we can be able to check the temperature here and also this is um, 7.4 and then to get the time taken here is 4.4 uh, minutes. And moving to the next one, this question is testing whether you understand the formula energy equals to power times time. Then we are supposed to work out the energy that was required for the water to boil. And in that case, we have um, the power times 4.4. Remember, 4.4 was minutes, and our time has to be in seconds. So that's why you can see I'm multiplying by 60, so that we can be able to have the time in seconds. And if we work out this, uh, can you check with me? Uh, what are you getting? We are going to get um, our answer as 580,800 as the final answer at this given point. Give the reason why the liquid water should be stirred during the heating. Remember we need heat distributed uh, throughout the liquid, the entire part, so that when you are measuring the temperature, it can give you an accurate answer, which means that uh, you can be able to determine the heat has been distributed in this liquid. So in order to ensure that heat has been distributed, we are going to stir the liquid so that uh, this heat is uh, uniformly distributed throughout the liquid. After finishing the experiment, the student removes water and the heater and places the container of water into a freezer. And then we are told that uh, the we need to me so that uh, we can be able to draw the temperature graph how does it behave from 38 degrees celsius to 
when the ice is uh, negative 20 degrees Celsius. So you are going to see that temperature is going to decrease and then at zero water because we are told that um, water becomes ice at zero degrees Celsius. So there is change of state at zero degrees Celsius until all the water has been converted to ice. So we are going to have a flat part at this given point. And then once all the ice has been uh, formed or the water has been converted to ice we are going to have now the ice losing the heat to negative 20 degrees celsius so which means at this particular region here this is a uh, water losing heat and uh, here water is changing state from uh, liquid to solid and at this point the ice is cooling further so meaning there is also temperature change at that given point if you are finding value uh, please consider subscribing and also you can leave a comment down below on if the tutorial was helpful to you now moving further to the next part we are going to talk about pressure and we are told that propane gas is stored in the cylinder at a pressure of 1.03 times 10 raised to the power 6 pascals. State the formula linking pressure, force, and area. And when you are given this question, it means you are writing the formula pressure equals to force over area. Remember, force should be Newton and the area should be in a meter square. The cylinder has internal surface area of 1.13 meter square. Work out the force exerted on the walls of the cylinder by propane gas so when you are given force pressure you are given area we can be able to rearrange the initial formula that had we are written so that we can have um, pressure is that but uh, now force equals pressure times area now we can be able to substitute the values and uh, our answer now can be given as what yes that's what you are expected to get and the next part we are supposed to explain why pressure exerted by propane gas increases when the cylinder is transferred into a warmer room now we know that uh, the uh, propane gas or gases have molecules and these molecules are in a continuous random motion they collide with the walls of the container now how does now increase temperature affect the pressure pressure increases now in this question we are supposed to justify why does pressure increase now remember when you move this cylinder to a warmer room temperature increases and when temperature increases it increases the kinetic energy so look at the situation here we have this kind of uh, animation here we have particles vibrating in their fixed position that is a, li a solid solid particles vibrate in fixed positions yes you can see they vibrate when the heat is continuing to heat this uh, solid now the particles are free to move so they collide now in gaseous state they collide with the walls of the container and you see as temperature is increasing the pressure gauge is also increasing because the number of collisions with the walls increases yeah just look at the way the, 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 the particles now when temperature increases the particles collide faster with the walls you see they're moving very fast so pressure increases you can see that so in this particular question this is the concept that you were supposed to talk about that increase in temperature increases the kinetic energy of the gases and as the kinetic energy the number of collisions per unit area on the walls of the cylinder increases and this result to an increase of pressure so there are other factors that can increase pressure in gases of course we can talk of uh, reducing volume increases uh, the number of collision because there is a small area over which these particles vibrate and um, you can also I get questions like that so if you cool a gas the kinetic energy decreases and also pressure decreases moving to part b given 
that the volume of propane gas is 1.03 meter cubic at pressure of 1.03 times 10 raised to power 6. That should be power 6. Calculate the pressure of the gas if propane gas expands and its new volume becomes uh, 2.45. Now you see when volume actually increases, uh, pressure is going to decrease. But in order to answer this question, uh, we are going to use the formula P1 times V1 equals to P2 times V2. Then we can be able to make P2 the subject because we are finding P2 and then substitute what we have. If we work it out, we are going to get our answers 4.33 times 10 to the power 5 pascals. And then you transfer here it here so that you can make the examiner happy. There is no extra mark for that, but that is meant to make have a good rapport with the examiner. Moving to electromagnetic induction, the most interesting concept in physics. Now we go to question 3 here. We are told the diagram shows a transformer that has efficiency of 100%. So when we are told that efficiency is 100%, it means that power input equals to the power output. Unfortunately, that is the first question. State the equation linking input power and output power of the transformer. Here, we are going to say power in equals power out. Don't forget that. That's the first question that you need to remember as far as uh, transformer is concerned. But uh, power is given by voltage times current, which is P equals to VI. And uh, we are going now to calculate the output current in the transformer. Now, using power in, power out, we can be able to rewrite this as V in times I in equals to V out times I out. And then in, this is uh, the primary coil and out, we are going to use the secondary co uh, coil. Uh, remember, we are using out because at the secondary coil, that is where now the power is going to be taken out of the transformer. Now we need to check the voltage in the primary coil and the current in the primary coil. That's well demarcated there. That is 230 volts so that we can be able to work output current. So output current. Now we can be able to make I out the subject and that this is going to become 230 times 2 divided by 110. So if we work out this, what do we get? Use your calculator here. Uh, this becomes 4.18. So in simple terms, what I'm trying to say is, be prepared to do such kind of a question. You have to know how to work out this. Look at this question as if your life depends on it. Moving to part B, Roman 1. State the equation linking input voltage, output voltage, and turn ratio of the transformer. So here, we are going to write to equations that represent this. This one can be written as V voltage in the primary coil or voltage in the secondary coil equals to number of turns in the primary coil over number of turns in the secondary coil. Or it can also be given as number of turns in the secondary coil over number of turns in the primary coil equals to voltage in the secondary coil over voltage in the primary coil. And I'm going to use this second part so that I can be able to uh, use it to answer Roman 2 because you are supposed to calculate the number of turns on the secondary coil of the transformer so that we can be able to uh, use the number of turn here number of turns that we are looking at the secondary coil, we have everything. Then we need to substitute all that we have and then make NS the subject of the formula. And this becomes that. And finally, we have approximately what? Use your calculator here and tell me what you got. I got uh, 573.9 and uh, I can be able to... I can be able to write this as, let me just try to write this down here, 573.9. Huh? Yes, I can give it like that. And then we can be able to proceed the next question. Another part, 
explain how a step down transformer works we are talking of a step down transformer do you know the purpose of a step down transformer a step down transformer is a transformer that reduces voltage and something else that you need to understand you need to know these two these two uh, transformers when we are talking about a step down transformer and a step up transformer they have distinctions in terms of the number of turns so a step down transformer reduces voltage and when alternating current flows through the primary coil magnetic fields which are constantly changing directions are created or formed and these created magnetic fields uh, are linked to the secondary coil by the soft ion core as the varying magnetic fields cut across the secondary coil a voltage is induced in the secondary coil which results to the flow of a current in the secondary coil so this is exactly uh, what you are uh, supposed to have stated in this particular question and uh, remember since there are fewer turns in the secondary coil we are going to have uh, uh, less voltage induced so that is why it qualifies to be that's why it qualifies to be a step down transformer because we have fewer turns in the secondary coil than the primary coil question number four uh, here i brought the concept of um, principle of moments and uh, you ought to prepare as well uh, how to answer questions on principle of moments and you can see here we are told that a meter rule is balanced on a pivot by three vertical forces as shown in the diagram below then we sup suppose to define the center of gravity at the center of an object you can be able to balance an object and that object will uh, remain at equilibrium will remain at balance will not topple to any side so which means the center of gravity is a point where much of the mass of the object is concentrated so we are going to identify that and uh, we are going to say that uh, center of gravity can be defined as that the cog of course that's where the cog is because we are told it was a meter rule it is 100 meters so the center is going to be where we have the 50 centimeter mark one part we have 40 we have 10 then that makes 50 so the cog is at that point and then now we can um, go ahead and write this definition this is a point where the mass of an object is concentrated show that the moment of the 50 newton that dot is misplaced it should be 50 newtons it's 50 newtons let me change that moment equals to force times perpendicular distance that is the formula we shall use to work out the moment but we need to show that yeah this is 50 newtons yes you now have changed it on the diagram don't look at the equation because that was a mistake so it should be 50 newtons there we have a force we have 40 centimeters and 10 centimeters and 20 newtons so we are supposed to show that the moment of 50 newton about the pivot is 2000 newton centimeter so we are going to say force times perpendicular distance will enable us to work out the moment this is going to be 50 times the distance the distance is 40 centimeters so if we multiply here we are going to have 50 by 40 and this is going to give us 2000 newton centimeter next using the principle of moments calculate the force f for the meter rule to remain at equilibrium now i want you to be very very keen here the pivot is placed at 40 
centimeter mark from one end and when you are doing this kind of questions uh, I want you to be careful because all the part, the distances that we are talking about here are measured from where the force is to where the pivot is so we have force F and 20 newtons they are on one side on the same side of the pivot and therefore these two forces are going to give us a clockwise moment so if we want to work out the moment due to these forces we are going to say clockwise moment equals to anti-clockwise moment now at equilibrium at balance the two moments must be equal therefore we need to work out a clockwise moment and since we had worked out anti-clockwise moment which is in uh, roman 2 we are going to equate them in order to work out f but under the clockwise moment we have two forces so we are going to have the sum of the two moments which means that we are going to say here clockwise moment sum of clockwise moment equals to this one here 20 newton times 10 which is going to give us 200 of course and then now we have another moment from the pivot to, to where the force is and remember from the pivot to where f is that is going to be 60 centimeter you need to be keen on that that is going to be 60 centimeter because all the distances are measured from where the force is to where the pivot is i'm repeating that because that's the area most of the students most of you make mistakes so having that is f times 60 and then we, we can be able to write this as 200 plus 60 f then we can be able now to equate this to the uh, anti-clockwise moment which was uh, 2000 and then this is going to be taken on the other side of the equal sign and this is going to be 60 f equals to 1800 divided by 60 both sides we shall have our f equals to what equals to 30 newtons another question that uh, another question that uh, another question that is usually asked is uh, what's the magnitude of the normal reaction force at the pivot and the concept that we shall use to find that is that uh, at equilibrium downward forces equal to upward forces we have downward forces that are acting on the pivot um, on both sides we have 50 we have uh, 20 newton we have also 30 newton that we have obtained so all these forces f 20 newton and 50 newtons are acting downward and the force that is supporting these forces that is preventing from the meter rule going down is the pivot force that is acting upward so the pivot force uh, will be acting upward so normal reaction force is going to be 50 plus 20 plus that which is 100 newtons so you see the normal reaction will be acting upward like that so meaning some questions in some exams you can be asked to indicate the direction of the normal reaction it will be acting upward and that is 100 newtons going further to the next concept so that we can be able to check we are talking of um, electromagnetic uh, uh, induction we are told when a conductor carrying current is placed in a magnetic field it experiences a force when the switch is closed this is a concept that uh, we learned in class and man, many times most students find problems in us answering questions like this uh, we are supposed to explain why that happens why does a conductor experience a force when it's placed in a magnetic field if this is one of the questions that you usually find difficult, a question that you have uh, found difficult to answer in here, I need to give you a very precise answer that you are supposed to give. Uh, one of the facts that you need to remember 
when current is flowing through a conductor when current is flowing through this conductor magnetic fields are created around the conductor due to the flow of current and these magnetic fields that are created interact with the magnetic fields of the permanent magnet so we are having a two pair of uh, fields that are acting there magnetic fields due to the flow of current which are concentric and are, are acting around the conductor and also we are having the fields of the permanent magnet so we are having a set of two fields which are going to pull and push each other remember when you have magnets they push and pull each other because of the interaction of the field and that is the same thing that is happening here so when this happens when current flows through the conductor magnetic fields are created around the conductor these created magnetic fields of around the conductor are going to interact with the fields of the permanent magnet hence the conductor experiences a force that's what you are supposed to say in this particular question number um, part b you are supposed to state two ways in which this force can be increased how can you be able to increase this force remember this force is as a result of uh, uh, the fields of the permanent magnet and also as a result of uh, a flow of current so in that way we are going to say that we can be able to increase this by two ways number one yeah i needed to also mention this that uh, you can be able to determine the direction of this uh, force by uh, fleming's left hand rule yeah now by increasing the amount of current in the conductor you are going to increase the force and also by using stronger magnets which are going to provide strong magnetic fields next we're supposed to state two ways in which this force can be made to act in the opposite direction one way is to reverse the direction of uh, to reverse the polarity reversing the poles of uh, the magnet and also you can be able to reverse the direction of current uh, in order to change the direction of uh, motion of the force so by reversing the terminals of the cells and by reversing the poles of uh, the magnet that will affect the direction in which the force is going to move well uh, also you need to remember when both of them when the poles and the terminals are reversed both of them there is no effect in the change of uh, the motion explain the effect of the conductor on the conductor if an alternating source is used in the previous section we used direct current now when we use alternating current there is something that is going to happen remember alternating current keeps on changing size and direction so the fields that are going to be created when using alternating current are going to be changing size magnitude and direction so the conductor will vibrate up and down and this is because the fields created by the alternating current are constantly changing size and direction so the conductor will vibrate up and down now we're going to talk about um, this uh, symbol electric motor these are also some of the questions that um, um, are usually tested we are supposed to identify a, a few parts that we have here we have uh, a metal or graphite brush in contact and uh, this is uh, for conductivity and also reducing friction because these uh, commutator are sliding the commutator are there to reverse the direction of the current so that the motor continue moving in the same direction we have also the permanent uh, fields the permanent magnets which are going to produce the magnetic fields and um, we have also the flow of current in this uh, loop and when current flows through this loop magnetic fields are created around that uh, loop now you see since we also have uh, uh, fields of the permanent magnet 
the two magnetic fields magnet magnetic fields due to the flow of current in the coil in the coil and the fields due to the permanent magnets they are going to interact and then there is a force as we had mentioned earlier so we need to try to talk about this and i want to identify this coil a b c and d and you can see in one arm current moving up on a b current moving towards us now explain how an electric motor works now when electric motor switch is switched on current flows through the coil now we have um, fields of course created here and uh, there is this magnetic field of the permanent magnet so when current flows through this ab is going to experience an upward force when current flows through the coil ab uh, magnetic fields are created around it and those magnetic fields interact with the magnetic fields of the permanent magnet hence the part ab is going to experience an upward force while cd is going to experience a downward force now we are going to have a rotational motion at the loop here yeah now you see uh this is another part we can talk of uh, electric motor we can also be tested on dc generator now you see we have a magnet we have uh, a bulb somewhere there so if we happen to rotate uh, this loop the loop is going to cut across the magnetic fields as it rotates it will be cutting across the magnetic field now when the loop cut across the magnetic field electric current is generated in the conductor a generator produces current but a motor uses current to bring about rotational motion so when a wire cuts across magnetic field a voltage is induced in a wire through electromagnetic induction now state three modification that can be uh, that can increase the speed of the rotating coil now to increase the speed we can be able to do that using a stronger magnet also by using more coils or we can increase it by increasing the amount of current in the coil that's what we are supposed to do e we are told the diagram shows a loop of wire connected to a power supply and we are supposed to describe how the field how to find the magnetic field produced by the loop of wire the easiest way to describe the magnetic fields forms around this uh, piece of uh, wire or loop of wire is by using iron filings we are going to sprinkle iron filings on the cardboard now once we have sprinkled these iron filings we are going to tap the cardboard then once you tap the cardboard these iron filings are going to arrange themselves in a regular pattern and this pattern now is the one that dis um, displays or represents the arrangement of the magnetic fields around this they are circular concentric and um, they have a very beautiful pattern like that now the next thing that you ought to do in order to get your um, final mark you need also to indicate how do you determine the direction of the magnetic fields so to determine the direction of the magnetic fields of course you are going to use um, uh, a plotting compass now this is what you are supposed to write sprinkle iron filings on the cardboard and next you need to tap the cardboard gently and then what do you notice the iron filings are going to rearrange themselves uh, to form a regular pattern this pattern that is formed around the conductor represents the magnetic fields uh, due to the flow of current now to determine the direction of the current we are going to use plotting compass in order to determine the direction of 
carrot i believe you are getting value from uh, this video please consider subscribing even even though maybe you are doing your final exams just the best thing to, the, the, the the best present you can give me as per now is by just subscribing and liking this video and uh, so that youtube can be able to recommend uh, this video to others even if it's not going to be of help uh, later on just please subscribe that give me that uh, present of subscription i will also be motivated to create more for others and uh, at the same time this channel is going to be a concoction of uh, also a level videos so uh, i believe later on we are going also to uh, benefit we are going to have much uh, videos physics videos for a levels so please that's why i'm requesting you give me the subscription uh, the next part you are supposed to draw the way the patterns are around here and uh, that's what we're going to have and then we're going to have the direction of the field which you can be able to use right hand grip rule right hand grip rule is uh, the, the the rule that you use to in determine the direction of the fields around this now uh Question number six, we are told a student uses an oscilloscope to determine the speed of sound. Uh, so meaning you have to prepare on uh, how to determine speed of sound using different experiments to determine speed, speed of sound. This is one of them using a CRO. There are other experiments like uh, using echo method whereby you stand a given distance away from the wall. You produce a sound and you determine how long it takes to hear the echo. And when you're using that experiment, you need to use a meter rule, uh, a tape measure to measure the distance from where the wall is to where your position is. And also you need to have a stopwatch to determine how long it takes to hear the sound. Now, at that given point, you are going to use the formula speed equals to two times distance over time. Because sound travels twice the distance it travels to that point where the wall is, then back. Another experiment for sound determination is when two people standing distances apart, a given distance, maybe 100 meters is the standard distance when you're using that method. Two people standing uh, 100 meters apart, one produces the sound and the other also stops a stopwatch uh, once he hears or she hears the sound produced. Errors in those experiments can be a reaction time, error due to stopping the stopwatch or error due to measuring the distance longly that can also be tested now back into this question using a CRO we are having the y direction the y direction is giving us the amplitude x direction is going to enable us to get the periodic time time is on the x x direction and remember here we have uh, time in milliseconds one square is one millisecond what does that mean one millisecond is the same as one divided by one thousand so that you work out the time in second you need to divide one by one thousand now the student uses two microphones a microphone is also required here and some questions you may find they are asking you which other apparatus is required at that given point when you're given that question additional instrument is a microphone which is mentioned here all right uh, so when uh, this experiment is performed uh, my two microphones are used like that and now when you measure the distance between the microphone that represents the uh, wavelength now we are supposed to state the formula linking speed frequency and the wavelength of a wave and we're going to say speed equals to speed equals to frequency times wavelength frequency has to be in hertz and uh, wavelength has to be in meters you have to remember that always use the oscilloscope to calculate the speed of the wave we are using the formula that we have stated now we need to work out the periodic time and period time is time for one complete oscillation one complete cycle so we have one complete cycle uh, when we have four squares so times one millisecond that becomes four times um one millisecond that becomes four milliseconds that's the periodic time but remember our time is in millisecond 
So what are we going to do? To get the time in seconds, we're going to divide by 1000. So our periodic time, time one, time for one complete cycle is 0 0.04 seconds. And we know that frequency is one of a period, which is going to be approximately 250 hertz. Now we can go back and work out the speed. Our speed is a uh, frequency times wavelength, which is going to be 250 times wavelength, which is 1.4. It was given there. And when you work out that, that becomes 350 meters per second. I believe you've uh, understood how to work out such questions. Please comment down below. Give this video a like. Differentiate between renewable and non-renewable energy resources. When we are talking about renewable and non-renewable energy resources, these are two uh, energy resources that uh, we discussed in our lessons. And we say that energy resources that do not deplete, that can never be finished, that can never be used up are renewable energy resources, which we can um, define as energy resources which can be replenished can be can be replenished once used they are regenerated naturally they never are, are never used up so examples include solar we can talk of geothermal we can talk of hydroelectric power we can talk of uh, wind power we can talk of tidal uh, power so these are the renewable so you need to understand this definition and also you need to understand advantages involved in these types of energy resources now we can talk also have a talk of uh, non-renewable energy resources which are um, type of resources which cannot be uh, readily uh, replaced once you stop once you use them it takes a, a longer period of time to replace them or you cannot even replace them Examples include nuclear energy, coal, we talk of natural gas, we talk of fossil fuels, and many others. Yeah. Then uh, you also need to understand uh, advantages and disadvantages of using this non-renewable to the environment and also uh, the advantages. So basically you need to go straight and take, check those advantages disadvantages and advantages before you sit for your exam. The photograph shows Green George's Dam in China, one of the largest hydroelectric power stations on Earth. State two advantages of generating electricity using electric power station. What are the advantages? Number one, it's sustainable and is renewable form of energy. Yeah, is renewable and sustainable. We can talk it's clean and environmental friendly. It does not produce harmful gases. It does not harm, harm the environment. So it's clean and environmental friendly. It does not produce CO2. That's one of the advantage. It does not contribute to global warming because that does not produce uh, greenhouse gases. Uh, it can produce energy to meet the drastic and immediate demands. Yeah, we can also talk about it can generate. It can. Uh, it it has a low maintenance cost. So, uh, even though the capital of starting uh, an hydro hydroelectric power station is high, but now after you have uh, built it, after the country has built it, it has low maintenance cost. And it has a long span. It can serve people for a long period of time. Okay. Let's move to cosmology. Let's move to uh, another astrophysics concept. Now, do you know the origin of the universe? Do you know how the universe began? The universe has a very long history there are different theories that explain how the universe began right uh, from our religion our traditions 
and science also have uh, its own perspective how the universe began uh, in the specification we are going to base our argument in the big bang theory big bang theory claims that the universe began about 13.8 billion years ago and the universe expanded from a single incredibly uh, single short uh, small dense point and that point was very hot so it expanded to become the universe we have so big bang theory still claims that the universe is still expanding so what's the fate of our universe if something is expanding and it continues to expand it will reach a point where that thing's going to explode so uh, i believe we are going to live and see that happen but for today i want us to talk about how cosmic micro background radiation cmbr supports big bang theory so when you are given a question to show how uh, the presence of uh, cosmic micro background radiation support big bang theory what are you going to say i believe this is a candidate question this is a pregnant question that can be given but in an exam so according to big bang theory the universe originated from a hot dense point that expanded to become a universe detection of cosmic microwave background radiations of short wave uh, wavelengths spreading from all directions serves an evidence by the claim that they might have an indication that they might have been created during big bang theory during the explosion so since we are able to detect this background microwave background this my cosmic microwave background radiations everywhere in the universe spreading in all directions so we tend to imagine where they might have been created during the explosion so this is the evidence Part B, you are supposed to describe how the size and temperature of the universe has changed this is Big Bang Theory. We say that the, the, the universe, according to Big Bang, uh, the universe originated from a small, hot, dense point, which expanded, and the universe is still expanding. So how does that affect the size and the temperature of the universe? So, initially, the universe was incredibly small and dense since then the universe has expanded and cooled down so this result to the increase in size of the universe and decrease in temperature but see discuss two pieces of evidence that supports big bang theory we have already mentioned them but i brought this question up so that um, maybe one of them can be asked uh, so that you know exactly how to approach it when we are uh, we, we, um, putting these questions i'm just giving a concept so that when a question is asked you know how to approach it it also can be asked like this and uh, we have two evidence we have um, the existence of uh, cosmic microwave background radiations and also we have the redshift that is observed from uh, distant galaxies so existence of uh, cosmic micro background radiations cmbr appears to be the same everywhere and acts in all directions they might have been uh, originated from uh, big bang theory so uh, during that explosion so when we see that we can be able to see that uh, indeed the universe might have originated from big bang theory the next uh, evidence you are to give is the redshift that is observed from um, light emitted by distant galaxies uh, so this redshift this redshift indicates that the galaxy is moving away 
which means that the universe is still expanding and remember this is an assertion this is um, a claim of uh, big bang theory big bang theory says that the universe is still expanding so when you see the redshift that galaxy are moving it means that still the universe is uh, expanding and indeed we can be able to confirm that next particular question that you can uh, you can be asked in order to answer we talk about a doppler equation doppler effect equation now we are told that hydrogen gas in the lab on earth emits light with a wavelength of 605 nanometer a distant galaxy contains hydrogen which emits light on the same wavelength now it emits in the same wavelength but when that wavelength is observed from the earth it's seen to be 683 nanometer so you can see there's a change there's a shift in wavelength remember doppler effect is the change in frequency or change in wavelength when the observer is moving relative when an object or when the source of the wave is moving relative to the observer so since the universe is moving we are going to detect a different wavelength and now in order to do that we are observing the universe from earth then uh, we have the light that emitted so when you observe the wavelength of the light emitted of by hydrogen has a different wavelength and that is now doppler effect doppler effect is the change in frequency or change in wavelength when the source of a wave is moving relative to the observer so we are supposed to calculate the speed of uh, this galaxy now we're going to use the formula change in wavelength over the reference wavelength equals to velocity or speed of the galaxy over the speed of light which can be written like this so the change in wavelength can be subtracted we can be able to subtract these two in order to get the change in wavelength which is going to become 78 nanometer now whilst we have that we can be able to substitute into the formula we have uh, this is uh, the reference wavelength which is lambda naught and uh, we have uh, the formula and then we substitute eh? so the speed of the galaxy is going to be 3.87 times 10 raised to power 8 7, uh, uh, times 10 raised to power 7 meter per second as the speed of uh, the galaxy we have come to the end of uh, this particular video i believe you've gotten value i continue revising for your exams and my humble request is for you to give me that subscribe subscription i'm going to prepare still another uh clip which will be dealing with topics that never appeared in paper one those topics that were not in paper one so there are high chances they will be tested hl diagram handsprung russell diagrams uh stars or uh, ev evolution of stars how do stars larger than the mass of the earth evolve that's the next video i'm going to upload in a short while otherwise all the best for your exams and subscribe if you want to check that video i've mentioned i'm going to add a link in the description in this video see you See you next time.